um, my job for the next 12 minutes is to give you some um, ideas about the sorts of things that we can do to get better prepared for this event. And when I'm talking about preparedness, I'm talking about things that you can do for your own families, for yourselves, for your business, and for your community as a whole. So my interest in this area started about 20 years ago almost when I was a young, fresh-faced geology student and I did some work on the Alpine Fault. And I used to sit up in the hills and look back down across the coastal strip and watch the Maui vans beetling up and down. And knowing what I knew about the Alpine Fault and what it could do as a, in terms of a large earthquake, I used to wonder and worry about what tourists actually would, would do. Because, you know, we, we know West Coasters are pretty resilient people, but what about the people that were here visiting and didn't have any idea that this event could happen? So that really piqued my interest, and it wasn't until 20, uh, 2005 that I started my PhD looking at precisely that, the tourism industry, its potential to be impacted by a future Alpine Fold event. So some of the findings that we, that we came up with from, the, from that research, uh, and remember this is all pre-Christchurch, was that tourism operators were aware of the likelihood of a future Alpine Fold event. I think most people knew that, that it was likely to happen again. We we're at the end of this seismic cycle. Uh, but most of them were poor on the consequences. What did it actually mean for these tourism businesses? Not, there wasn't a much awareness about how long it's going to take for you, your business to recover, for visitors to return, for roads to be reinstated, etc. A lot of people put the risk outside their own lifetimes um, by putting it 30 to 50 years into the future. So effectively, it's not going to happen to me. There was a lot of thought about getting prepared, and they thought that that was worthwhile, but most of them lacked confidence in their level of preparedness. And we discovered a, a poor use of what we call resilience tools, how, to, to have good insurance, to induct your staff and teach them about some of the hazards that might happen while they're living and working in this community, about training their staff about ongoing emergency <coughs> preparedness and um, scenarios, etc., and in terms of developing some plans for your business. And also we found that there are a lot of small to medium-sized businesses uh, and, and throughout New Zealand, but especially on the West Coast, and many of them just didn't have the resources to commit to that kind of planning. So here's an example of some of the data that we, we came up with. We had some survey questions which asked them to comment on a scale from strongly agree to strongly disagree. Getting prepared with, will help my business to recover. And there was general agreement there, which was really promising. But on the next slide, it shows that um, they were quite uncertain about their current level of preparedness. There was uncertainty and, and in fact, disagreement that they were well prepared at that point in time. So let's step back into the, the broader New Zealand context in terms of the seismicity. So here we have a, a chart showing all of the large earthquakes greater than magnitude 7 since 1840. And you can see that we have a record that's peppered with events. The, first, the largest of those was the, um, the 1855 Wellington earthquake. Um, followed by some other large events, the Napier earthquake, which remains our most fatal or, or deadly earthquake with 258 fatalities. And then one that you may not recognise, the Resolution Island event in um, 2009, which took place in deepest dark at southwest Fjordland, so it didn't really have much impact. And you might notice that the 6.3 Christchurch earthquake doesn't even register on this chart, but of course it was so shallow and so um, intense that it did so much damage to Christchurch. So what this is really showing us, and the intention here, here is to point out that um, there are periods of time where there are clusters. And in a social context, that means that for people living around here, this is very relevant. They've had a cluster of events in the 30s and 40s, and wow, you know, you've got to be ready for these sorts of things. But what followed after the Inangahua event in 19, 1968 was a very long period with no damaging earthquakes in New Zealand. And so what this effectively, effectively does, or did was cause complacency. People thought, well, you know, we're doing well, we've, we've, we've gone a long time without an event and we're pretty safe and we don't need to worry too much. Okay, so some work that I've been doing with a student in, at Canterbury University, Tom Robinson, has looked at um, mo modelling some of the impacts on our critical infrastructure, our critical, critical lifelines, including electricity, telecommunications and roading. And, and I'm going to give you an example here of the impact caused by landslides on our roading network. So again, this is similar to a slide you saw earlier, a, a pre-earthquake and a post-earthquake environment here in um, Sichuan province in, in China. So you can see the amount of uh, landsliding activity in the, in the, in the central, um, epicentral region there. And that's what we're likely to ex experience in the Southern Alps. And then we modelled that data against what we will probably find in, in the Southern Alps area. And you can see all the red area is the high intensity of landslides. 
And if you look at that in the context of our roading network, so here are all the state highways in the South Island. And here uh, is the modelled exposure of those highways to landslide damage. And you can see most of this area is in green, and that is effectively low, low risk, low exposure to landslide hazard. But as you get into the Southern Alps, you can see more and more orange and yellow colours, especially through here, the blob of red, <laughs> sorry, right on the Fox Hill, um, <laughs> and, and, and down here towards Haast and through the Haast Pass. So increasing damage in those, in those areas along your highways. And if you look at the next slide, you can see the use of these highways by visitors. So this is quite old data, but it gives you an idea, the thickness of the line indicating the amount of travel going on by tourists on these highways. You can see, of course, the most popular route is through the central part of the South Island to Milford Sound and back. But, you know, there's, there's a decent number of people coming along that circuit around the West Coast. So what we're likely to see is road closures in Arthur's, uh, in Arthur's Pass, Lewis Pass, down the, the state highway here, um, through Haas Pass and probably into Milford Sound, road closures which could continue for a period of up to six months according to the Transit, uh, transit Agency, the New Zealand trans, Transport Agency, sorry. So that's a very long time to be isolated by road. Okay, so some of those short to medium term issues in, in some um, access is gonna be a major problem, damage to the roading network. You're going to have infrastructural um, issues in terms of delays in reinstating those critical lifelines, power, transport, telecommunications. Um, for industry and business, there'll be such disruption to the supply chain um, and network disruptions. For example, Franz Joseph receives daily supplies from, um, from the truck delivering you know, food and essential items down here. And if the roads close, then those items won't be able to get through. So you'll have to have you'll have to make do with what you've got for a period of time. There'll be a significant drop in visitation, of course, because the, an earthquake of this scale will hit the international headlines. People will probably re re remove New Zealand from the itinerary in the short term um, due to you know fear and anxiety of, of ongoing aftershocks, etc. And as we've seen in Christchurch. Several years can go by before those um, tourist numbers start to recover. And it won't just impact the West Coast, it's going to be an, a phenomenon that affects the South Island, if not the whole country, in terms of a from a tourism perspective. So what can we do? <laughs> what can we do? This slide's in blue, it's meant to like wake you up and say, what can we do? So, <laughs> so recovery, uh, the good news is that recovery can be improved by putting in some thought before the event, by mitigating issues by planning prior to the disaster actually happening. And there's a new buzzword that's been bandied around quite a lot since the Christchurch earthquakes, resilience. You know, you're probably quite familiar with it being resilient West Coasters, but we've heard a lot of talk of Christchurch people being resilient after the, the events over there. Um, and it's important not just as a community, but as an individual to build your own resilience, to build the resilience of your business. And in the next few slides, I'll talk about some of the ways that you can try and do that. So you and your family, what can you do? And this, none of this will be very new, but I think it's just a nice reminder of some of the stuff that you can do. Um, I've got a family plan as my, the top priority there because I think, especially on the coast, people go to school, they might work in a different part of this long, narrow corridor. Um, and it's possible that you might be isolated from members of your own family. So you need a bit of a plan. Where do we meet? What, what could we do in that eventuality? So of course, storing useful food and water, there's nothing new there. Having a full gas bottle so that you can you know, look after yourself for a period of time after this event. You can mitigate issues before, you know, before this happens at home. You can strap your water heater, which means that your water heater won't fall over and, and spill all the water. It means you'll have a water supply after this event. You can reinforce or remove your chimney, save it collapsing down onto your house and doing severe damage. You can attach heavy items to the wall so that you don't have these hazards within your home with the, during the shaking. And you can look at your insurance, and of course that's a bit of a tricky issue, but yeah, it's worth looking at and trying to iron out some of those issues beforehand as well. I'd urge you to talk to your neighbours and you know, network within your community, talk to perhaps you've got an old neighbour who might be extra vulnerable, who might need some extra support and get to know your civil defence plans and, and be prepared for several days without external help. And, you know, I'd suggest being prepared for a longer period than that. You know, look at perhaps a week without any help from, from the outside because high priority people will be getting the first 
you know, the first, um, first help from outside support. But it could be that if you're doing all right, you're not injured, you might be there just sort of hunkering down and it would pay to have enough to keep you going for maybe a week or more. Next slide. So your business, what can you do for your business? So again, I think it's really important for business operators to take some proactive steps before this event. Have a look, a really close look at your insurance. Talk to an agent who knows what they're doing and make sure that you've got yourself well covered. In terms of training your staff, when I was doing this research for my PhD, we found that about 80% of, of tourism operators inducted their staff, but only very few talked about natural disasters, natural hazards, any kind of anything about that. So that's a really amazing opportunity. If you're sitting down having a chat to this person who might have just arrived from France, they don't know anything about the seismic hazard of this, this region, have a chat to them right there and then and say, look, this is what we'd probably do. We've got to shed out the back full of supplies. We've got first aid equipment over there. Just something, just something to give them a heads up. Again, network within your business community and, and talk to people about supply chain issues and what you might do if, if, if this, when this event happens. Store essential supplies and back up your data. <laughs> you know, it's just amazing how many people didn't back up their data after the Christchurch event. We saw even after, a year after that event, 50%, only 50% were backing up their data. And um, it was a huge lesson for people. It really, really affected their recovery because they couldn't access their client details and they couldn't you know, get hold of anyone to try and get some business coming back in. And again, another, another thing is to test your preparedness using scenarios. And this, this um, New Zealand shakeout, I don't know if you've heard of it, there was actually a West Coast shakeout event in 2009, which I, I was involved in. But two years ago, there was a, a shakeout event, a nationwide one. And there, there are some awesome resources for businesses to test their, their um, preparedness as part of that shakeout. So that could be something you could choose to do. It's happening again this year in, in September or October um, this year. Okay, what else? Um, so after Christchurch, a whole lot of different resources have become available. And one of those is a, a, a brochure called Shut Happens. <laughs> Say that right, or else. <laughs> So yes, business closure does happen, but what can you do to protect yourself or to get prepared for those sorts of prolonged business closures following a disaster? And this is a toolkit that resilient organisations at the University of Canterbury has developed. And it looks a bit like this. Um, it's, it's a nice accessible brochure style. The next slide will show you some of the checklists that are available, just to give you an idea of some of the actually fairly basic things you can do as a business operator to try and, and, and improve your level of preparedness. I mean, it might involve like a planning a morning tea to talk about a crisis scenario and what would your business do in that event. Um, so yeah, and there are lots of other suggestions in that brochure, so I'd urge you to have a look at that if you're interested. Another thing, this is slightly more academic-y, but it still tells us an interesting story about how to build, what are, what are the things that help build organisational resilience. So don't worry too much about everything around the outside edge, but the three critical things here uh, the, the, the keystones, the, the cornerstones of organisational resilience. So you, having a strong leader and a strong culture of resilience within your organisation is really going to help you. So that can involve you know, um, engaging with your staff and being innovative and creative and having a strong leader at the helm of your business. You can be change ready, which indicates the ability to be adaptive and agile when a crisis hits. And we saw that in Christchurch, some of the businesses there did really well because they were able to adapt and change their business structure or whatever it took. They might change their location, something, uh, these sorts of things to really help um, be adaptable after a crisis. And also the importance of networking within your supply chain across businesses with civil defence, all these sorts of things you can do before the crisis to help you recover more quickly. So all of these things help you build your organisational organization, resilience. And actually you can go online and test um, how resilient your business is. There's a, little, there's a link there to a resilient organisation's um, little test you can do. It's very quick and then out spits a, a bit of a an idea of how you, you rank on this scale of poor to good. That sounds a bit sort of average, doesn't it? Excellent would have been better. Anyway, so then you get a ranking. There's a little line there that indicates how, how good you are and it gives you some areas to work on for your business. Lessons from Christchurch was that it's all about the people. It's all about your staff well-being. It's all about people springing up as you know, spontaneous leaders in this crisis. Um, the volunteerism that sprang from that event was amazing with the Bafami army and the student army, etc. So all of that stuff just sort of happens organically and it's really great. But there are some things you can do to help foster that before a crisis actually happens. 
So become part of a community group or organisation. That's a great way to start. Just to engage with the, the neighbours and the people around you. So your community, again, we're stepping out to a bigger sort of a scale here. So you know your community better than anyone else, and so you need to think about what resources would you need. Let's think that in Franz Joseph, you might have several thousand tourists on a summer peak summer day, and there's an earthquake and you're, all, you're sort of isolated in town. What are you going to do with those people? How are you going to look after them? What resources would you need to do that? So that all comes into the planning, and I think you know some excellent work's been done by the um, Franz Joseph um, uh, emergency, what are you calling yourselves, the um, Glacier Country crisis management planning that's been going in, and it's fantastic. So there is work going on, don't fear, there is st stuff happening which is really good, and I've seen this happening over the last 10 years that I've been involved. Mount Cook, they were probably one of the first to have a really good emergency response plan, but, but Fox and France Glacier area has uh, followed and have some really good planning in place now too. Okay, so your visitors, you know, we're going to have these tourists and you can expect there to be quite a few transient people in town on, on the day of this event, so you need to help them out. And I think it's important to sort of build the awareness in these, peop in these tourists as they come down the coast by making information available to them. And it might be as simple as just having that in every motel or hotel, you know, on the back of the door alongside the fire evacuation policy, drop cover and hold. What it does is it says to them, oh, earthquakes, oh, that might happen, right. Hmm. That might be all they need to know. It might be just the trigger they need so that when this event happens, they think, yep, that's what I need to do. So that's something to, to, to consider. So Christchurch, a lot of people were surprised by the events of, in Christchurch in 2010 and 2011. But what we actually know is that we knew there was a history of large earthquakes and, and damaging earthquakes in the city. Over 80 years, there were four large earthquakes. This is a report from 1991 by a GNS scientist. Um, any, four, any one of those four events today would cost the city millions of dollars. So why was it such a surprise? This is the Christchurch Cathedral. Actually, you can't see, but the very top of the steeple fell down in 1908. We don't, want to, we don't want that to happen to you guys on the coast. We want you to be better prepared and not find this as a shock and, and surprising occurrence when it happens. And I think what we've learnt tonight is that this is going to happen, um, it's inevitable, so we need to get some planning in place now to, to protect ourselves and our communities.